Hello everybody, uh, today we're going to try to talk about one of the most important topics which is refugees and when you find yourself in trouble and you have to leave either your town, um, your, your area that you live in or even your country or even the general geographic area that you live in. Um, so there are hundreds of millions of refugees. Uh, it really surprised me how many people are struggling with excuse me, with food, um, as I make friends around the world, I would say a significant percentage of people um, that I meet online, um, I'm not going to state specific places or countries, um, are actually really struggling with food. Um, even clean water is difficult in some places, um, and many of them um, have struggled not only for a little while, but for years as I've known them uh, online. So <clears throat> I wanted to try to take it into my personal responsibility to try to see what I could do to help. Um, so this document really started um, kind of in the Middle East um, and uh, particularly in uh, Pakistan um, and places that are both highly populated um, and also considered um, very dangerous um, because of the food situation. Um, and then it was re retitled to End Times Highways Emergency Food and Farm Document. Um, essentially highway to and from hell. Um, so it was a very difficult document to write um, and I had worked on this uh, for over a year or more to try to get as many details and help as many people as possible. The goal here, rather than having a very formal document, is to actually really help specific people. The belief is that if you help specific people that and you make friends with these people, um, that you can actually <clears throat> really help someone specifically in their life. <clears throat> now, um, it's not really just a financial problem. Um, so what you'll see is that uh, this is a wealth map uh, for the whole entire planet. Um, and basically, <clears throat> um, there are people in poverty, even in the United States. Uh, there's people that ask me for food all the time uh, right here along the West Coast, uh, which is supposed to be one of the more wealthier areas uh, in the United States. Um, there's actually quite a lot of poverty uh, in California, in Oregon, in Washington. You'll see hundreds and hundreds of homeless people, even thousands, uh, tens of thousands of homeless people for example, down in Los Angeles, um, on the street. Uh, you don't really see that as much on the East Coast, um, but there is a lot of homelessness all throughout the United States um, and people struggling. Um, so the problem really does hit here um, as well as I imagine the same. It goes in Europe and other parts and basically everywhere around the world. So no matter where you are, there's going to be some areas that you can help. Uh, and pr chances are the person probably isn't where they want to be or they're trying to live in a place that is difficult. So it's basically about housing and transportation as well as food uh, and, and other resources. So um, what you're going to see in this document is quite a lot of uh, information. There's 315 pages of documentation here. Um, essentially discussing all around the world, um, but it goes into some of the main topics, um, particularly one of the most dangerous ones, uh, if you've looked at some maps showing the number of survivors uh, of people that are trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea, um, actually it turns out the Mediterranean is one of the most dangerous routes uh, in the entire world. Um, so this is actually, this North African route um, is extremely dangerous. Um, and a lot of people trying to cross over from Africa to Europe and even from Europe to Africa. So um, there's basically one main problem here is that they basically are trying to get all the way to Europe. Um, and oftentimes they get rejected once they get into Europe and then have to go back. So it's a double, double problem. It's not only getting there, but getting back um, is also a problem. Um, I've seen photographs of people actually clinging onto the sides of boats, major huge boats, uh, near where the anchors are and actually trying to get uh, across the ocean uh, by hanging on to the sides of boats. So unbelievable stories um, that you're going to find out um, as you start to read some of this. Um, and then <clears throat> actual roads. So I wanted to get into the actual cities and the actual roads uh, that many people may travel. This is kind of the um, early idea of what it might be like to travel across the jungle. So believe it or not, um, a lot of people like to travel across Africa by foot um, and even by bike. If you look it up, you'll see some really extraordinary 
people um, who have already tried to walk across Africa, a friend of mine, well, it's kind of a friend of a friend, but he tried to break dance across Africa. So he got his skateboard and basically went from uh, Senegal all the way across Africa, break dancing for money and also on his skateboard. So there are some absolutely funny and really interesting proposals to try to get across Africa. But the refugees for thousands of years and perhaps even for millions of years have tried to do this kind of stuff. And as you can see, people try to go into the jungle and then realize that maybe that's not such a great idea and then cross all the way over here to Nigeria. That's one route. Um, you can see um, different routes um, <clears throat> excuse me, around the world. And this highlights some of the more interesting and dangerous parts of what people are trying to do. You looked at that North African route, you'll see some of that here. Now, I wanted to get into seeing what the artificial intelligence could say about this research project and try to get as best help as we possibly can to see what's going on to help people around the world. So this document is over 300 pages. We fed it to the artificial intelligence to see exactly what it thought about all these ideas and what we can do specifically. Now, surprisingly, artificial intelligence doesn't get into too many details, but you're gonna hear some interesting results. And I'm gonna page through the document as we listen to it. All right, so um, you have really outdone yourself with these sources, maps, articles, wow, even personal notes. This deep dive is gonna be intense. We're talking about global migration, food security, are you ready for this? Spirituality and the universe. It's all connected, apparently. So today we're gonna to try to highlight the most important insights about refugee highways, the future of food, and uh, some very surprising connections between geography, spirituality, even humanity's future. Phew. Yeah, it's crazy how these sources connect things you wouldn't think were related at all. Like the author seems to see these hidden links between migration patterns, food security, even like the cosmos. It's kind of wild. Yeah, totally. Speaking of connections, one thing that really jumped out at me was this idea of wildlife roads. The source like really emphasizes those and not just for, you know, animals. We're talking refugees too. Right, exactly. They talk about this road deep in the Congo jungle, connects Kinshasa and Brazzaville. And uh, they think it could be a route to Luanda, Angola, to relieve like the pressure on big acidies. Legos, for example, mm -hmm. and maybe even, you know, provide cheaper housing outside the jungle. It makes you think about how something designed for one purpose in this case, helping wildlife, can have like these massive ripple effects on completely different things like migration. It's true. It really highlights, I think, how we need to think outside the box, especially when it comes to these huge global challenges. And then there's that other example, that road from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur ending in Myanmar. Okay, so wow, I can't emphasize this enough, and I'm glad that AI yeah, picked up on this concept. So throughout this whole entire document, you're going to see basically people that are trying to cross these vast landscapes, but you're also going to start to understand how the wildlife transfers its lives across all these great expanses. We don't really see that in the United States as much. Uh, oftentimes, we only have uh, you know 10 or 20 wild animals in a square mile. Uh, some of these areas in the jungle, you have thousands of wild animals, um, all different types. Um, you have you, you can have thousands of types of monkeys. Um, not only are there thousands of types of monkeys, there's you know just billions, trillions of species all around the world. So basically, this document tries to get into thinking about not only how to help humanity migrate, but also the wildlife. So there is a pretty big emphasis here. You can see there's a road between uh, the kind of the edge of the jungle here and then kind of this edge, uh, uh, <laughs> the waterfront over here in Angola. You can see some more details. Here's Kinshasa and Luanda and kind of the path that you might take uh, to get uh, between these two cities. Um, so essentially the concept here is how to get people, well, one of the problems is people are moving further and further into the wildlife areas, making it very dangerous, um, resulting in what was called the Congo War. Um, so if you want to do some African history, that would definitely be some uh, dangerous part of the history, as well as the side on Rwanda and what happened over there uh, with the genocide. So there's quite some serious problems to look at. Um, the other thing that AI was talking about here um, is this road. Um, so one thing that I didn't post in here, which I probably should, is the global map. Uh, I'm going to get a hold of that map for a second uh, to show you of where the wildlife is on the planet. So what we did is we looked at 
uh, essentially the entire planet uh, and the roads that were most meaningful for the wildlife as well as the people. So this one turned out, the Singapore road turned out to be such a very important road because they're building a major highway right through these jungles um, and essentially bridging right into the ocean front. So basically once you get out to Singapore, you start to get out to all the islands. So Java and Indonesia is already heavily populated as well as Sumatra here. Uh, and you can see the road, they've tried to build some fences here to protect the wildlife, but essentially what that does is it makes it, animals get trapped in the fence. You'll see really terrible pictures of just animals getting caught in these fences. Um, and or getting hit by cars um, and all these kind of things. So here you can see they've not only had high-speed roads, but there's also high-speed trains. And so this train, and this turns out because of the weather pattern, uh, in the summertime, uh, in the wintertime, it hits basically along the west coast here. And then in the summertime, it hits along, oh, excuse me, uh, yeah, the east coast. I think that's right. Um, so you have to kind of look at the seasons here and see which season is even safe to drive because the rain could be a whole meter. You can get not just a couple feet, but a meter of rain um, in a month. So that's a pretty extraordinary amount of rain. Um, and then there's also this route through North Africa. I'm gonna keep continuing on with the uh, discussion here and you can look at some of this document as we listen. The, the author, author is blown, blown away by the biodiversity there and, and the, the population, population density, density along that route. Yeah, yeah they, they mentioned they something like over 1,200 animal, animal species per square mile in some spots. Like that just blows my mind. Yeah, yeah it, really it really shows how we need to find that balance, balance you know, between, between development and protecting, and protecting these incredible ecosystems. 100%. And speaking of challenges, um, the source is clearly very concerned about the refugee situations in Africa, especially, and of course, Afghanistan. Definitely. And get this, they have some uh, unconventional solutions like encouraging migration to very specific places. They mentioned Argentina, Jamaica, even Greenland, though they do say that there are obviously some pretty uh, potential risks involved. Risks and difficulties. They acknowledge that for sure. There's this big emphasis on like personal connections being more effective than just, you know, bureaucratic processes, especially when it comes to like seeking asylum. The source points to Greece as a good example of this more personal approach. And there's this theme that keeps popping up, collaborating with South America, Brazil especially, like that seems to be a big part of their solution. Yeah, and you know. So one of the questions uh, that we looked at with basically when you're talking about 100 million people as refugees, uh, is where do all these people go? Uh, where where do you want to go and where should you go? So there's a whole huge um, debate on that. Um, so as you look around the world, um, if you're a refugee in North Africa, you have all these choices, right? From Turkey all the way to Lisbon, Portugal, as well as all these islands uh, to work with. And basically what you probably should do before you do any of this is fill out some paperwork and make sure you carry paperwork showing that you are uh, indeed entitled to move to a specific country or you have uh, are seeking asylum, what's called asylum. Um, and it's quite complicated. The, pa the paperwork's so complicated that a lot of people can't even fill out the paperwork themselves. So um, anyway, but that gets you started. Um, but as you look around the world, um, you're gonna start to see uh, the importance of refugees, particularly in the Middle East. Um, and that's why this document primarily focuses on Africa as well as um, uh, the Middle East. But it turns out many of the solutions are actually in Brazil uh, and in South America. So um, it turns out many of the people look like people in South America. It's just way too far. Um, so you actually need an airplane ticket to do the solution uh, down in South America. So um, that um, actually, uh, there is lots of food here and there's also lots of land and undeveloped areas. So um, the only problem is that it basically turns into the same problem as we see in Africa. And it's actually even more important because there's also a lot of drug problems and just uh, other types of problems that you wouldn't see in Africa that you would see in South America. I'll continue on with this discussion here. So it all goes back to that idea of working together, right? Especially when it comes to something as urgent as food security. And they are not messing around when it comes to the situation in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Yeah, it's like scary when they point out that almost a third of all the food on earth is wasted. That just shows you how badly we need better systems. 
you know, yeah, to, to get, get the food to where it needs to be. Absolutely. And uh, this, they suggest these weekly food meeting houses mm. in Pakistan with, uh, wait for it, indoor farms. Food meeting houses. Okay. So what else is in their food security toolkit? Let's see. Oh, redistributing Russian wheat, sending it to Pakistan, Afghanistan, even Djibouti using the Suez Canal. They even talk about getting Pakistan involved in like East African food initiatives. It's pretty ambitious. Wow, they are thinking big picture. But it makes sense, right? It all goes back to that international cooperation thing. Exactly. Yeah. And there's more. Rooftop farming in Silicon Valley. That's another one. They think it could help with those local food needs in a place that seems like a million miles away from these global realities, you know? Yeah, and speaking of Silicon Valley, the source goes off on this whole tangent. They're like really critical of how Silicon Valley is so focused on technology. And they think it comes at the expense of these real world problems, like food insecurity, especially. Yeah, it's like they're saying, can all this tech solve world hunger? I think they're calling for a serious shift in focus from like gadgets to gardens. Right. And they point out how few Pakistanis and Afghans are represented in the tech industry, especially compared to like how dominant Indian and Chinese individuals are in that space. It's a call for more diversity, more voices. Totally. It's about making sure that all this progress actually benefits everyone, not just a select few. And while we're on the topic of innovation, the source is a huge advocate for trains. Yeah. As a greener alternative to cars, obviously. Yeah, they talk about the terrible air quality in India, China, Thailand, you name it. The environment is definitely a big concern for them. Yeah, they're really pushing for better railroads, more trails, anything that can make transportation more environmentally friendly, basically. Okay, get ready for this, because the source takes a hard left turn here into some pretty unconventional ideas about spirituality and the universe. Yeah, this... Okay, so as you heard, uh, there's kind of a change in the document. So uh, what we wanted to do is look at the pollution areas. Um, here you can see in China, all this gray cloud is essentially pollution. It goes from all the way past Wuhan, um, well into deep parts of China. So um, this happens in India as well. I think I have some pictures of India, North India. You can see it's the same picture here. So. Uh, you're also a refugee of your own environment, right? So this whole environment, there's a billion people live in here, and then yet another billion people live here in North India. So it's no joke, um, and this is a specific uh, map from, I think it was January 11th, 2024, so that's just recently. Um, and you can look at uh, zoom.earth to get some of these images. Some of it will go back that far, some of it won't. Um, you can use NASA, uh, whole earth imagery as well to look at this um, and then i wanted to look at the biggest refugee highway in the entire universe and kind of change the whole entire discussion um, to someday being a refugee of our own planet uh, and how we can basically work together uh, on getting off this planet um, so there's a little bit of a discussion on that let's see how that goes here in this discussion this is where, where it, it gets, gets really wild, wild. Okay, okay you ready for this <laughs> they, they believe in a spiritual link between, get this, the Middle East and the middle of the galaxy. And they want to build these advanced telescopes in Afghanistan and Pakistan because they think that area is like the birthplace of a spiritual telescope. Whoa, okay. There's a lot to unpack there. What do you make of all that? Well, it seems like they see this really profound connection between like geography, spirituality, and, you know, the cosmos. It's a completely different way of looking at the world. Right. They've got this whole thing about Tasmania, too, because of its unique shape. And they think it might be a key part of something they call the golden triangle of life. Something about spiritual exploration and maybe even like extraterrestrials. Yeah, they seem to be convinced that Tasmania, because of its unique geography, could hold the key to these deeper, you know, spiritual truths. Maybe even contact with life beyond Earth, they say. It's a lot. And then there's this Golden Spectrum project. I don't know what that means exactly, but it sounds like it involves reshaping Earth and uh, creating a pathway to a new life, maybe even on a different planet. Right. That one is the most abstract for sure. Yeah. But it seems linked to this idea of a final planetary resolution. And something about like flipping the Earth's magnetic fields. It's a lot to process. Flipping the Earth's magnetic fields. Okay, that sounds like something out of a movie. But it shows you how much they believe in the possibility of, like, radical change. For sure. Okay, we should probably talk about electromagnetic travel static. You ready for this? So they're warning people about traveling to certain places because they think it can have 
like, like these, these consequences. consequences. Okay, go on. Consequences, consequences like what? They, they see it as disrupting, disrupting like, like the Earth's energy fields. fields. And, and they, they even, even suggest things, things you can do to, like, counteract it. Visiting, visiting supervolcanoes, for example. Yellowstone, Yellowstone specifically. Wait, hold up. They, they think these supervolcanoes, super with all their, you know, energy, can neutralize this travel static. That, that seems, seems to be the idea, idea. yeah. It, it all goes back to this theme of spiritual awareness and respecting the Earth's own, like, thinking and energy. It's pretty out there. I mean, you can't deny it. This author is a serious thinker. It's like they're blending these personal experiences with global concerns and like cosmic possibilities. I know, right. Yeah. It's a lot to take in. But they're challenging us to like really broaden our perspectives to see how humanity, the environment, even the universe are all connected in these ways we might not even realize. Definitely a lot for our listeners to think about. This source is definitely food for thought. They're urging us to really look at our relationship with our planet, to consider different spiritual perspectives, and to you know work together to make sure humanity has a future. A call to action. They want us to push our boundaries and like be open to these ideas that might seem you know kind of out there at first. Exactly. Question everything. Yeah. And like engage with the world in a more holistic way. And there's this sense of urgency, you know, like. They really believe our future depends on finding solutions now. Oh yeah, that urgency comes through loud and clear. It's like they're shaking us and saying, wake up people, we don't have time to ignore these problems. Right. One thing that stood out to me is how frustrated they are with people spending so much time online. Especially in Silicon Valley, it's like they... Okay, so what I was going to try to show here is the uh, declination field lines. So basically what... Uh, we went into is a discussion about how the uh, electromagnetic spectrum affects how people do everything. Not only does the wildlife depend on this, but also the cloud patterns and many other things that you may not quite anticipate. Um, so um, what we did is we grabbed a map um, and there's many different maps of how this works, but um, the declination field is available here. Uh, and I'll just load it up really briefly. Hopefully it will load pretty fast on this computer uh, over the internet. Um, and you can start to see, uh, there was a discussion that I did last week on this, uh, basically how refugees are on one side of the line or on the other side of the line. So one thing you may consider is that if you're on the red side of this line, the compass actually points a whole different direction. That can be 90 degrees. So can you imagine a metal bar moving 90 degrees and being in the wrong direction its whole entire life? How that would affect uh, the psychology or even the growth of what's going on, or even it's flipping the only whole other way, right? So people that grow up on one side of these lines are actually kind of electromagnetic refugees of one side of the line or the other. Um, that isn't really discussed a whole lot in the document, but it is discussed a little bit. Um, and as you can tell, the AI did pick up on that concept, um, but I grew up on this side of the line. Now I live over here on this side of the line. So it kind of makes sense to live on both sides of this line, even if you're in the United States. And also you can travel to even to South America. I could have gone down here to Urshur away um, and even to Antarctica to kind of balance that out, right, if I grew up in Chicago. Um, but basically the compass does work pr pretty correctly in the center of the United States as well as in the center of Africa, as well as in India. You can see the center of India there. And then Southeast Asia, the compass does work pretty good. But essentially, if you're really detailed about what's going on, you may consider other things like that. I'll continue on with the discussion. You think of those folks are totally out of touch with what's really happening in the world, too busy with their gadgets to see the real problems? Yeah, it's a big critique of that disconnect, you know, between the virtual world and actual reality. They're basically saying that being glued to our screens all day is part of the problem, not the solution. And they don't hold back. They even compare Silicon Valley to like a haven for terrorists and tell people to just stay away and focus on real world solutions instead. It's strong language for sure, but you can feel the frustration there, can't you? And while we're on the topic of strong opinions, they really lay into racism in places like China, Russia, and Afghanistan. They see it as like, this major obstacle to global cooperation, which we desperately need if we're gonna solve things like food security and the refugee crisis. It's a really powerful statement. They see racism as this fundamental barrier to progress, you know, 
Like it's holding us back from working together to face these huge challenges. It's a good reminder that these issues go way beyond politics and economics. They're deeply human. It's about how we treat each other, how we choose to live together on this planet. Absolutely. It's about recognizing our shared humanity and, you know, working towards a common goal. You know, even with all the urgency and like strong opinions in these sources, there's a glimmer of hope there. They seem to really believe in human ingenuity. Like we have the potential to turn things around, but we have to act fast. I see it too. They're not just pointing fingers, you know. They're offering solutions and urging us to step up and create a better future for everyone. One more thing I wanted to touch on. This whole final planetary resolution concept, they seem to link it to, like, flipping the Earth's magnetic fields and finding a, quote, path to a new life, possibly on a totally different planet. It's a lot. Whoa. That's a pretty mind-blowing concept. Yeah, so... You know, essentially, our planet is getting very hot, right? You can see that many of the places that the refugees are in, including India, most of the Middle East, um, and even in South America, um, and certainly large parts of Africa, are actually just too hot. Average temperatures being 100 degrees per day or more. So um, that becomes basically a part of the refugee diagram map. Um, and I wanted to just, I'm going to save this image and add it to the document right now because I realized that was kind of missing um, from the document. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds like, like they're saying we need to radically rethink, rethink our whole relationship, relationship with Earth. Maybe, Maybe even consider, consider the possibility of life beyond, beyond this planet. planet. That's, That's next, next level. level. Definitely, Definitely pushes, pushes the boundaries of how we usually think about things. things. It, really it really makes, makes, makes you wonder, wonder though, though, are their ideas really that far-fetched? Maybe they're just a reflection of how deeply they care about the future and how strongly they believe that we need to be open to radical solutions if we want to survive. It's a call to, you know, think bigger, be open to the unknown, even when it feels like uncomfortable. One thing that really struck me was how much they talk about water, like earthquakes creating water, especially in the Himalayas. They see it as like a source of water for the whole planet. Yeah, it shows how deeply they understand nature and how vital water is. For everything, you know? Totally. And they talk about learning from wildlife, too, especially when it comes to figuring out this refugee crisis. Like, animals can teach us about adapt. So I think I might stop this here. Um, it does become quite an extensive conversation overall. Um, but uh, like I said, there's just hundreds of pages here of documentation for you to look at and to try to understand what's going on in all these areas. Uh, you'll see like a little town hospital, uh, just a study based on what's going on at this hospital um, here in uh, Pakistan, actually. So, um, but anyway, so there's a lot of different details, uh, things that may help you. Um, at that particular, this particular example showed how to start uh, having this be more of an area to, to transport food uh, and also work with local grocery stores as well as the hospital. Um, and also work on rooftop farming, uh, even at the hospital, um, so that because people often have to eat when they're in in bed or in the sick or unhealthy situations. So the hospital becomes a very primary source um, to look at. And then here you can see some of the public transportation uh, around a particular town as well and, and some other people that are involved in this. So hopefully this will help you understand a complete picture for what it's like uh, to travel around the planet. So if you're thinking of traveling somewhere, um, no matter where that might be around the planet, you'll see some very beautiful uh, pictures here of different places um, and just what's going on as well as some riot pictures. You can see they're trying to destroy a church. Someone sent this to me via text message and I was just like, whoa, what is going on? They're like destroying their own buildings. So uh, anyway, but uh, it's a very extensive document. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, proposing many different kinds of solutions. Uh, so if you are interested in refugees or even traveling anywhere around the world, take a look at this document. Um, you're going to see uh, a very extensive picture, um, primarily of the areas that we've already discussed. Uh, and look at the food on this truck, right? This is essentially what's going on. You have a picture where they're trying to get you know food to these really wild places. Um, and you're definitely going to learn a lot about transportation, how to make money, um, and work with all kinds of places around the world. We're talking about helping not only the 100 million people, but really billions of people uh, in a document like this. Because there's just so many people that depend on food every single day, many times a day, as well as clean water. Uh, and I probably should have even looked at more details 
than what is here, but the document kind of gets to be pretty extreme. So we wanted to try to maybe uh, add uh, or even refine this into uh, smaller documents uh, and work with everybody that's involved. Thank you so much for your help, and I really hope this will help you out a lot.